Hello! This video continues our discussion of section 3.2 and here we will discuss section 3.2.2 and 3.2.3 together in one video. The aim of these two sections is to determine how large the error of a Monte Carlo estimate for a given sample size n is. We already know the error should go down as n increases, but we will quantify that now. And then by turning around this relation, we will be able to determine what sample size should we choose to achieve a given level of error. Good, let's jump straight in. We have that n m c equals 1 over n sum j from 1 to n f of x j. And we use this as an estimator for the expectation we want to work out, so for expectation of f of x. And I want now to consider the question, how close is that n m c to the expectation of f of x? To approach this problem, we will use techniques from statistical inference. In statistical inference, estimators are a standard topic, and they are standard methods for saying how good an estimator is. And three of the quantities which are of interest are the bias of an estimator, and the standard error of an estimator, and the mean squared error of an estimator. And I will be a bit short here in the book. You can read the generic formulas from statistics for these expressions. Here I'm going to write the formulas applied to our estimator Z and MC. And what we get is the bias of Z and MC. That tells us how far away the estimator is on average from the correct answer. The average result of the estimator is the expectation, by which I mean the estimator is random. We have already seen that because it's computed from the random values xj. So every time we compute the estimate, we get a different answer. And the average of all, all of these answers is given by the expectation. And I want the difference to the truth. So I subtract the truth, the quantity we want to estimate. It's also an expectation, but it's expectation of f of x. So that is the first measure we will consider. If that is positive, the estimator systematically overestimates the value. If it's negative, then it would systematically underestimate the value. And what one hopes for is that it's zero, so that one gets on average the correct answer. The second quantity I want to consider is the standard error of our estimator. And that is by definition just the standard deviation of ZNMC, or if you want to, the square root of the variance of ZNMC. And finally, the mean squared error, that is the most important of the three, that combines the other two, namely that tells us how far away from the truth we are in a squared sense. So let me first write that. It's the expectation of ZNMC minus the thing we want to estimate, expectation of f of x, and this squared. So ZNMC is our estimator, expectation of f of x is the quantity we want to estimate. The difference squared is measure of how good we are. If it's small, we are good. If it's large, it's not good. And the square is here so that both negative and positive errors count as being bad, and they cannot cancel. Contrast for the bias, positive and negative errors can cancel. So if we are sometimes too big and sometimes too small, the bias may still be small, whereas the mean squared error captures this and both being to be low and being above counts as an error because of the square. And again, we want the mean squared error small. So it's always positive, but the closer to zero it is, the better. The bias could be either positive or negative, and we want it close to zero. And the standard the error measures the fluctuations of the estimator. So if I do it again, how different are the answers? And generally, you would also want the small, just that you have a stable estimator, which gives you similar answers every time. One can show that that is the variance of the estimator minus the bias squared. There is a proof of this fact in the book, and I suggest you now go to the book and read the proof of lemma 3.12, which explains why this equal sign here is true. Before we go on, I need to correct an error in what I just wrote. Hopefully you have all spotted this already. The bias measures the distance between the estimator and the truth on average, but what I wrote here was not the estimator, but I wrote f of the estimator, which is a nonsensical thing because the estimator has the f built in. So what I should have written is z and mc. I want to work out all three quantities, and let's start with the bias. The bias is rather easy. You see, it's the expectation of the estimator minus the truth. So first thing we need to do is we need to work out the expectation of the estimator. Expectation of z and mc. And now we need some rules of probability. 
if you are not familiar with these rules in the book in an appendix i believe it's appendix a you will find the summary of these rules but it is very terse so probably it would be better if you took one of the beginners probability textbooks and just reminded you of the rules or you just pick them up as we go here. So the first rule is not about probability, it's just substituting what the definition of ZNMC is. ZNMC is 1 over n, sum j from 1 to n, f of xj. That's how we defined it. Now comes the first rule of probability. It says multiplication with constant, you can take the constant out of the expectation. So it's 1 over n times the expectation, sum j from 1 to n, f of xj. Next rule, summations can be taken out of expectations. That is also a rule which always holds. There are no preconditions you need to check. You can just do that. So 1 over n, this sum where j ranges from 1 to n can be inside the expectation or outside. It makes no difference. So we get expectation f of xj. And now we need to remember what the xj were. The xj are iid copies of x, so that means they have all the same distribution as x does. So for the purpose of computing the expectation, that depends only on the distribution, on the statistical properties, not on the actual random values, we can replace xj with x. So we get that. And then we can just write 1 over n, and all terms in the sum are the same. So we have n of them, so we get n times expectation f of x. And now we are there, we just cancel the 1 over n and the n, and we get expectation of f of x. Great. Let's just go through that again very quickly and see what rules we used. First equality sign, this one, we needed the definition of ZNMC. Next equality sign, we used one of the rules for expectation. It's expectation of constant times random variable equals constant times expectation of the same random variable. So we can take constants out. Here I did that with the constant 1 over n. Next equality sign, we use a rule for expectations for the sum. So there is a rule from normally written for 2. Expectation of x plus y is expectation of x plus expectation of y. And instead of x and y, I use the f of xj, and I have more than 2 here. So what I do is I have a sum of n terms, so I first split out the first one. So I take x equals f of x1, and for y I take all the remaining terms. Then I have an expectation of f of x1 outside, and then I use the rule again to take out expectation of f of x2 and so on until I have split it into individual expectations and I get what I wrote. I get 1 over n sum j from 1 to n expectation of xj. So there. Now the sums are all outside. Good. So the next step is equal since the xj are iid copies of x. And after this nothing exciting happens. Now I just do simple algebraic step. Say I have a sum over n terms, but they are all the same, so I can just write n times the value. And then the last step is I cancel 1 over n and n. So that brings us to the end of this calculation. And what we get is the expectation of z and mc equals the expectation of f of x. If you think back, expectation of f of x was the quantity we were trying to work out. So that is the truth. Let's just flip back one page. The bias has expectation of the estimator minus expectation of f of x, but we have just worked out the expectation of the estimator equals expectation of f of x. So we have just seen the bias equals zero. Good. So that was easy enough. And before I go on, I just want to talk a bit more about how to read these proofs. If you don't have a mathematical background, proofs might be a bit scary for you, but we just did one and I think it wasn't too bad. So what you need to do is you need to, while you read the proof, ignore the big picture and just check for correctness. And for that, you break it down into small steps and check each step. So that's what I did here. I did the expectation of Z and MC equals the expectation of 1 over n sum j from 1 to n f of xj. So if I write that, you need to check is this true and we checked. The next equal sign that checks out because it's the rule of the expectation, the one after two, and so we check them all. So Again, what you do while reading a proof is you try to check correctness and just for each small step you check is that small step true. And then 
the final thing is we know if all small steps are true, then the big thing which is built of them must also be true. So if we put them all together, we need to just check the start and the end. And with this argument, we have just seen the expectation of that NMC equals the expectation of f of x. And there are very many things in the middle which we use to get there and which we all check that they are correct. But what we get, the result you read of that the first term equals the last term. So that's how you read the chain of equations. The steps in the middle are to make the argument. And they are small steps that are easy to check. And first term equals last term, that is then the result. When you read proofs in the book, you should always go through the small steps and try to understand each of them, try to check each of them, and then only afterwards you check what result did you get. While you do that, you ignore the bigger picture. When you are done, then you look at the main result, and that's the thing where you look, is it useful and this kind of things. And we have just seen that specific proof gives us the argument the bias is zero, so that means the estimator on average gives the correct answer. Good. And in the book, let me find the page, there is a proposition. So what we have just done is we have done the proof of the first part of proposition 3.14. The first statement there is bias that an MC equals zero, and we have just seen that. Now, let's just try the next part again. For the next part, the next part talks about the mean squared error that variance on the right hand side we can also write that as standard error of z and mc squared that's the same thing so to get the mean squared error we need to now also determine either the standard error or the variance one is the square root of the other it doesn't matter which and the variance there are rules for it that will be easier so we go with the variance same logic we do small steps which are easy to check and in the end that equals something will be the result so step First step is as before, we plug in the definition, sum j from 1 to n f of xj. Then we need rules for the variance. The first rule for the variance is constants come out as squares. It's different than expectations. Variance constant times x is constant squared times variance of x. I do that with 1 over n, I get 1 over n squared. Variance sum j from 1 to n f of xj. Next rule is about sums. That rule is a bit more complicated. Namely, it is variance of x plus y equals variance of x plus variance of y. So far so good, but there is a somewhat annoying extra term plus two times covariance of x and y. That is the rule. In our case, we will see that x and y will be replaced with x1, x2, x3, and so on. And we have assumed that the xj are IID. So the xj are independent. So when we substitute xj for x and y, what we will get is that we have independent terms. And for independent terms, the covariance equals zero. So in our case, the covariance goes away. And with this, we have a rule which looks like the rule for the expectation. Variance of x plus y equals variance of x plus variance of y. Let's use this rule. It just means we can take sums out of the variance. So we get 1 over n squared, sum j from 1 to n, variance f of xj. And now we continue just like we did for the expectation. Namely, each of the xj has the same distribution as x has. So the variance of f of xj is the same as the variance of x. And as before, now we have n identical terms in the sum. So we get 1 over n squared n times variance of f of x. And this time 1 over n squared and n do not quite cancel. So we have 1 over n left over and we get 1 over n variance f of x. That is the result. Now let's go back to pages. We are doing that to work out the standard error and the mean squared error. The standard error will just be the square root of we have just worked out. And the mean squared error is the variance minus the bias squared. We know both of them now. So what we get is mean squared error of Zn Monte Carlo is variance of the estimator minus bias of the estimator squared. And let's just collect that. Variance is 1 over n variance f of x. And the bias we worked out here, the bias we found to be zero. So that term doesn't contribute anything. It's minus zero squared. So we get variance f of x divided by n. And that is the final result. There are some more details to this, but that computation shows us the mean squared error decays if we increase the sample size n, like one over n. So that looks good. If we double the sample size, then computing it takes double as long, but the error is only half as large. 
One problem with this argument is that the mean squared error like the variance is a squared quantity. So if I do the mean squared error of 2zn, for example, then I would get four times the mean squared error. And if f had units like meters or so, then the mean squared error would have these units squared. So that would then be in square meters. So what we really should be doing is we should look at the root mean squared error. That's a quantity a bit like a standard deviation. And that has units comparable to the quantity we are interested in. And just by taking the square root, we get that the square root of the variance of x over square root of n, or standard deviation of f of x still divided by square root of n. And that is a more relevant quantity. So RMSE stands for root mean squared error. And you see the error really the case like one over square root of n. So to get the root mean squared error down to one half of what it was, we need to take four times as many samples or expressed differently. If we want one more decimal digit of precision, so if we want the result to be correct to one more decimal digit, we need to get down the error by a factor of 10. And then we need to sadly increase the sample size by a factor of 100. So that square root of 100 is the 10 we want. And that is the reason that we get quite easily quite large sample sizes. So with this in place, we now know that the error decreases proportional to 1 over n. And given we know that, it's now a rather simple matter to determine which n we need to achieve a given error. So let's do that. That is really rather straightforward. So to achieve an error where the root mean squared error equals epsilon or smaller equal to epsilon, we need, and now we just gather the relation from the previous page, epsilon is then, if I turn it around, bigger or greater the root mean squared error of ZNMC. And that we have just seen equals the standard deviation of f of x divided by square root of n. Now we just rewrite that. So let's square that. Epsilon squared is then bigger or equal to variance f of x divided by n. And solving for n, that's what we want. We want what sample size do we need. And what we find is rather straightforward, namely we get n is greater or equal to variance f of x divided by epsilon squared. The direction of this inequality makes sense. So to get the error small, we need n large. So if we want an upper bound for the error, what we get is a lower bound for n. If we have n larger, we can voluntarily do that. Then it's clear the error will get even smaller. So larger n are always okay. And now here is just the last question. The aim of this whole section is to estimate the expectation of f of x. And if we don't know the expectation of f of x, it seems rather unlikely that we would know the variance of f of x, so the quantity here in the numerator. But that is what we discussed in the previous section, namely we can estimate this from data. We can estimate variance f of x from data using the sample variance of the f of x j. And we have discussed how we could compute these. So this argument in a slightly extended version is presented in section 3.2.3. And what you should do now is you should take the book and read everything until the end of section 3.2.3. There is some detail which I have not covered in these videos, but again, that should be all easy to understand after you have worked through the videos because it is just more detail added, but no new ideas added. So go and read the book. And after you have finished everything until section 3.2.3, the next video will discuss section 3.2.4, which is a slightly refined version of this bound we have just discussed. This concludes our discussion of the error of Monte Carlo estimates, at least of the basic version. And there is one more video to come. The video about section 3.2.4 will give a refined estimate of the error where we will use the central limit theorem to get slightly better bounds.